Okay, this one we are talking about Safety PLC. This is going to be an intro into Safety PLC. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of why we need safety systems in general and a little bit introductory into the world of safety systems and safety PLC. Uh, things to look out for in this video for your questions. Uh, what are some of the ways that a system can fail and become unsafe? Uh, what are some features of a safety system? Uh, what did we do before safety PLCs? And the fourth one, why do we prefer safety PLCs over other types of safety systems? So first of all, I guess, why do we need safety? Uh, let's talk a little bit about how standard logic works. So this is what we've been writing so far. In the labs, we've been writing all standard logic. So we control lots of dangerous motions in our PLC systems right now using just standard logic. So this works pretty much. However, it is definitely not perfect. So here's an example of why we say that. So if we look at this, uh, this video here, uh, here we have a little conveyor system, just a simple start stop circuit. So this is looking okay. You have a start, a stop, but what happens if someone actually changes this code a little bit? So for example here, if someone comes in and either intentionally or not intentionally were to put a little jumper around that stop button. So basically just drawing a loop around the stop button, basically making the stop button ineffective. Uh, let's assemble this and watch what happens. So basically now, if you were to push the stop button, once this is running, you really don't have a way to stop this system ever. Okay, so you basically, you can start, you're gonna lock that in with your seal. But as you can see, when we push the stop button over here, or pushing away that stop button, nothing happens. It is gonna run, it's gonna continue to run forever. You have no way to ever stop this system. So this is what we need to avoid. This is a problem with PLC driven systems that if the, if the programming is not correct or if it goes wrong or if there's something changes and there's lots of different things that can go wrong here, we don't have a way to ever, ever stop that. Okay? And that can be a real problem. So this is why we say we actually need a safety system to cover these types of situations because we basically have single point of failure in any of these types of systems. So what could these points of failure be? Uh, number one, standard logic could just be written wrong. We see this all the time in the lab. Okay, we write the logic wrong the first time. So if we don't have a way outside of our PLC logic to stop it, then we can make a motion that we can't control right away because our PLC logic is just wrong. Uh, other thing that can happen, Basically, anyone who's got a laptop and software can log into your PLC and they can change things on you. Okay, so that can happen very easily. Uh, so basically, logic can be changed by anybody, uh, either intentionally or not intentionally. They can just basically, what I just did in that example there, they can go in and change that and make things unsafe. Uh, also, we haven't done this in the lab, but you can actually force inputs and outputs on or off. So you can basically toggle them and put them into a constantly on or constantly off state. Uh, also, inputs or outputs on the hardware side, uh, they can just be wired wrong. You could have a motor that you just wired to the wrong output. You think you're turning on a light, you're actually turning on a motor uh, or something like that. Or you think you're turning on one motor, it's actually turning on a different motor. So there's lots of things that can go wrong there. Wiring can be changed accidentally or intentionally by somebody. And devices can just fail. You could have a motor contactor that drives a motor a motion. And you could turn that on and it just sticks and fails in that on state. You turn it off and you're actually physically removing power from it. Uh, but it's just staying stuck in that on state. That can happen as well. I've, I've actually seen that happen as well. It's kind of scary. Uh, so at that point, you're turning the motor, you're turning the motor starter off, but it's not even doing anything. So you've completely lost control of it. 
So because of that, all safety systems, either hardwired or software, when we talk about software, we're talking about safety PLCs, need to prevent all these conditions. And we typically aim for the highest level of safety when we're doing this, either category three or category four. We talked about these categories way back in the first year safety course. Now, if you do a risk assessment on a system, you might determine that you do not need the highest level of safety, but typically what people will do is they will actually uh, shoot for a safety level that's actually higher than they really need. Uh, so category three or category four is pretty easy to accomplish with a safety PLC. That is typically what most people will do. So how can we avoid some of these uh, point of failure conditions. So for example, writing logic wrong. That is basically just needs to be covered by doing a good startup and validation of your system. Uh, so the first time through when you're actually starting it up, you need to check over everything and make sure it is all correct. Uh, logic being able to be changed by just anyone. A safety PLC must be able to have logic that can be locked out and password protected. So as we'll see in some of the upcoming videos, that is a feature of the safety PLC that we're using, is you can actually, the safety section of the PLC code, you can actually lock that code out and password protect it so you can view it but not change it. Uh, the inputs and outputs can be forced in logic. This is something you can still do in safety, but uh, we are going to write things in a way that if somebody were to force inputs or outputs, the system would actually detect this and it would go into a failed or shut down state. And then on the hardware side, inputs or outputs can just be wired wrong initially. So when people wire up the system, they might not wire it correctly. Uh, once again, just like having logic that is uh, designed or keyed in wrong, you need to do a good startup and validation of your entire system. Uh, wiring can be changed. Same as what you can say to change software. It's more difficult to do, but you can actually go in and change wiring around. Uh, our system should be able to detect if wires get moved and they should go into a failed state uh, that will shut you down if they detect wires have been moved. And we'll show you how our software will actually detect those conditions. And again, uh, devices failing. If a device were to fail, uh, we are going to be able to detect that condition and again go into a failure mode and shut everything down if that were to happen. So things that all safety systems must have. And this is whether they are hardwired or whether they are software based with safety PLCs. Number one, they need to be difficult to defeat or to jump or out or to rewire by an unskilled person. So you really need to know what you are doing and be skilled with it to be able to defeat these systems. That is a requirement. Uh, number two, you need to be able to detect a single point of failure. So many of these things in the previous slides we talked about, you need to be able to automatically detect any of those and shut down and prevent a restart if any of those conditions persist. Uh, number three, all input devices in any type of safety system must be dual channel and they must be monitored. We'll talk later about what monitored means. And number four, all output devices must be redundant. So you'll see whenever we have an output device, we're always going to do two of them. So the way we used to do all this before safety PLCs came around, uh, so we're going to say prior to about 2005 or 2010, the very first safety PLC I ever worked with was in 2011. And I'll actually show you some examples of that particular program a little bit later on. But before that, the only thing I'd ever worked with was safety relays. Okay, so safety relays were the way things used to be done. Uh, so multiple safety relays. So this got very complex very quickly uh, and was difficult to design and involved a lot of wiring a lot of panel space being used and became very complex very quickly. Okay, so that is using safety relays like we're showing here. So here, these are safety relays. These are safety contactors here. OK, 
Okay, so relays and contactors, all parts of the safety system, all hardwired parts of that system. And then after that time, so probably catching popularity from about 2005 onwards up until today, uh, safety PLCs have really taken over the market. This is what everyone is using now. Uh, they've, the cost of them and the ease of use of them has really come down, and this is basically what everybody is doing now for safety. So modern systems are going to use a safety PLC. Uh, as we say with all software systems versus hardwired systems, flexibility is the number one advantage. Uh, it is much easier to change something or to design something using software than it is with hardware. Uh, easier to change. It is much cheaper once you scale up to a certain level, and most systems are going to be at that level. Uh, faster design uses a whole lot less panel space, and it's just all around easier and more friendly to use. So this is definitely the way almost everything has gone in industry now, unless you're talking about very, very simple systems. Uh, but safety PLC is definitely the way to go. So that is what we will be dealing with in the next couple sessions in this course. So here's an example of a typical safety system and how this would be applied. So this is actually from a drawing set of a project I did a couple of years ago. Uh, so here we have two motors. So you might be able to identify this a little bit from your electrical design course that you're doing. So here we have a motor overload and disconnect. And this is controlled by a regular contactor right here. This is actually two motors that are reversing. So you got a reversing contactor here. So this here would be controlled by regular logic. Regular standard logic would control this, basically turn the motor on and off. Uh, this would operate just normally. Now this power comes from here. So where is that being fed by? It's being fed by here. Now what we're going to see here, here's one more contactor, and here is a second contactor. And then these are going to be safety rated contactors. And these ones are going to be controlled by the actual safety system itself. So these would come on if your safety is good. They would stay on as long as your safety system is good. So they are a physical separation of your high voltage power from your motor circuit. So they're going to kill power, like physically break power to all the motor circuits. Uh, and then the standard logic would control the individual motors below that. But if someone were to hit an e-stop on this system, these two contactors would open up and physically separate high voltage power from all the motors outside of what the PLC regular standard logic is going to do. So that is basically how these systems would be applied. So the safety PLC would control these in a separate set of logic that controls just the regular process of the machine. So some examples of how this is going to work. You can see there was two contactors there. So we have contactor output one, contactor output two, everything on outputs so is going to be redundant. You're using two of everything. We do that in case one were to fail. You always have a second backup. You're never going to get two that are going to fail at exactly the same time where the chances of that happening is extremely remote. Uh, so this is controlled out of safety outputs driven by the safety PLC. And then for inputs to this system, remember we always said that our inputs are going to be redundant dual channel as well. We have an e-stop that has one contact going to this I.O. card and a second contact off the same in, same e-stop input going to this card here. So that is one e-stop device, so one button that has two separate inputs that go to two separate uh, safety input cards. Okay, so dual channel devices for everything. So basically one in, one e-stop gives you two input signals using those two input signals to drive two separate contactors to physically remove power from all the motors. 
So that is the way that that safety system works in this example. So in the next lesson, we're actually going to look at a simulation. I'll show you how the uh, safety logic in the PLC works and how we can control this system here using a combination of e-stops, light curtains, and safety gate switches all working together to make some different zones within this safety system. Okay, so that will be the next video. Thanks.